Good evening. Sometimes church starts feeling like a series of pep talks. That we have to come together each week. And just be encouraged to do something. Before we know it, our lives become one big pep talk of trying to talk us into being faithful and doing something in the name of Jesus Christ. I hope and pray that each and every one of us is drawing near to Him like never before. And that there's an urgency in our hearts to go and to do and to be and to serve in whatever way and whatever capacity we have to serve that we take the words that we study we take the words that we read over in the morning through the day we apply those pour it into the lives of the ones around us it's time for us to raise a hallelujah with our lives each and every day with us. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah Hallelujah, heaven comes to fight for me, and I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roll, and up from the ashes, hope will arise. Hallelujah With everything inside of me I raise a hallelujah I will watch the darkness flee I raise a hallelujah
Praise the hallelujah. Why? Because death is defeated and the king is alive. What a great, great message we have. The only message of hope, the only message of life in all of the world. Our king, our savior is alive and well all over the planet and all over the universe. And so we're grateful to be able to, to sing that to this evening. And I hope that you will continue to worship with us tonight as we gather together. It's going to be a very special night. It's, it's a Holy Week, Passion Week. It is the week, the last week of our Lord Christ as he goes to the grave, to the tomb, and then as he arose. And so we're excited to be celebrating that this week. We're doing something very special. Uh, tonight we're going to have a virtual Lord's Supper. If you did not know that or and didn't, we're not aware of that. We're going to be observing the Lord's Supper at the end of my message tonight. And so what we want you to do, and you may not have the typical bread and juice that we typically have at our services, but you have something. You probably have a piece of bread, you have a cracker, you have something. You can have uh, any t- type of juice, anything. Really, if you don't have anything at all, Jesus said, as long as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And so we're going to remember what the Lord has done for us. And so that will be at the end of the service. going to give you some time to gather some things together as you are worshiping with us tonight. We're looking forward to that part of our service and really all of it as we look at God's Word, as we continue worshiping together. Let me just remind you about Easter Sunday. No, we're not going to be on campus. And that has been a devastating, uh, difficult decision as churches all over our our country have made that decision. And uh, we are... We understand this, though, that the church is not confined to a room of people. We love to be together, but the church is God's people all over this planet. And so we're going to worship Him as countless millions of people before us in different generations have not even been able to gather for persecution's sake, for whatever maybe reason it is. We're going to be just like them. We're going to praise our Father where we are, and we're going to worship Him however it may be in whatever circumstances it is. We're going to be live on our platforms through Facebook, through our uh, YouTube channel, through our website at highlandchurch.net. We'll be live at 10 o'clock on Easter Sunday morning. Looking forward to that. We're also going to be at 10 o'clock on 101.9. That is not going to be a tape delayed message. It will be an Easter message that I'm going to record uh, tomorrow. And so looking forward to airing that so we can all on Easter Sunday celebrate the birth of our Lord, I mean, the, the death and the resurrection of our Lord Christ. And so I'm excited to be able to gather with you tonight. We want to we want to worship the Lord. And as they were singing that song, and it won't be long, we're going to have a message in a few weeks about where that song comes from and how the Lord has used that in the life of His people. But I wanted to read to you uh, as we continue in worship, Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. And so, God, we worship you tonight for who you are, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who sent your Son to die for us and who is raised forever and at whose name every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord and that is who we worship tonight in Jesus name we pray amen
Father, we belong to you, and I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you that on the darkest day, we belong to you. Father, I thank you that your word is truth, Father, and that your promises always hold. Lord, be lifted up in this time as we open your word, as we remember your sacrifice, Lord, as we remember uh, what you've done in that eternal promise that continues to carry us on in hope for that day when we see you face to face, Lord. Do what only you can do in this place. Unite our hearts, even though we're scattered. Continue to unite our hearts in you by your spirit. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, amen.
7 through 23, okay? Luke 22, beginning in verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover over lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it, just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, he reclined at a table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Verse 19, And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, verse 21, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as, as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. In verse 23, they began to question one another, which, one, which of them it could be who was going to do this. Father, I pray that we would question ourselves tonight with regards to where we are with you. I pray for that one that does not know you tonight. That, Lord, they would see their need of a Savior. They would see their need to bow to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Father, they would see their need of forgiveness for all of the things that they are trying to do on their own will never, ever pay for our sins. For your children tonight, as we listen to your word, as we encounter you tonight, Father, would you remind us of what you've done. Remind us that it is finished, that you have completed it, that you have paid it all. And remind us that you're worthy of our worship. And so, Lord, may, may we be honest with ourselves tonight as we look at your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to be a little bit different tonight as we look at the word of God. I, I don't want to be necessarily preaching and and slobbering and spitting all over the place. I just want to teach and walk through a section of Scripture that we cannot overlook and we cannot ignore when we think about how when we observe the Lord's Supper. And why in the world would the Lord use these two elements? Uh, why would He ask us to remember this? And so as we begin looking at this text of Scripture, the very first thing that we notice, and I want to remind you of this, folks, Jesus planned this trip. He planned exactly what was happening in this week that he would lose his life. He knew exactly where he was going. He knew exactly what he would do. And he knew exactly what he was going to eat for his last meal. Of all of the last meals that he could have eaten with his disciples, he chose this meal. He chose this meal, the Passover meal, this Passover celebration. It was no accident that he chose this meal. If you'll notice there in verses 7 and 8, it says that they came, then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And then you go over to verse uh, 14, verse 15. When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly prayed, earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So Jesus intentionally chose this meal, this celebration, this feast that he would share as his last meal with the disciples. And he was so connected to this that even later as the New Testament writers write about Jesus and they write about his death, they connect it to this meal, this meal of the Passover. Over in 1 Corinthians in chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, it should say, Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ... 
Our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And then when you come to chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, and Paul is writing there, we're going to look at that a little bit later as we walk through this message. But he reminds us that that night... This was the connection to Jesus. I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was was betrayed took bread. And so we know from the language of the New Testament writers, we know from the choice of Jesus, he chose to do this meal, this Passover meal, for a reason. Now back to Luke chapter 22. When we think about the Passover... And we think about where they met. And Jesus told the disciples to go and prepare the Passover and and get a room. I want you to remember that the Passover had been celebrated in Jerusalem throughout the entire history of Israel once they left Egypt. The Lord had commanded them to go and to celebrate the Passover. And so every year at this time, Jerusalem would swell with people. Many scholars believe as many as 3 million people would file into Jerusalem every year to celebrate the Passover. As you can imagine, there were not a lot of rooms available. As you can imagine, it took preparation to to pull this meal off. Not only did you have to get the stuff, and you had to find the stuff if you couldn't necessarily bring it all with you, but you, you, you had to find the stuff to eat the meal, and you also had to have a place to do it because there was nowhere to go. But I want you to see what had happened. The Lord prepared the meal. The Lord prepared this. Let's talk about Passover. It means here in verse 7, came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. There were several feasts of Israel. One of the, and they had all been ordained by God, and God had told them you were to practice these feasts throughout the year. Three times they had to go to Jerusalem. This was the first of the feasts. It was called the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which actually followed Passover. Passover was on day one which was immediately followed by seven days called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So they were used interchangeably, and the words were used interchangeably, and they constituted eight days of preparation, eight days of, of having the Feast of the Passover, offering offerings and, and, and spending time with the Lord. And so this was a, a, these, this was a very familiar, familiar time to everyone who was a Jew. Josephus was a, a, was a historian during the time of Jesus. Josephus lived during the time of Jesus. He was not a believer. He was not even a, really a follower of God necessarily. He was hired by the Roman government to keep track of the Jewish people and to record all of the events that they did. And so he was a secular historian who was writing the events. He, he, he mentioned Jesus several times in his writings. He says this about the Passover that went on in the first century. He says that as many as 255,600 animals were slain in Jerusalem for Passover in the first century. Think about that, folks. Three million people. Up to 225,000 animals slaughtered for Passover for the forgiveness of of the sins of the people. He says, considering that number of lambs that were slaughtered for our sins, for the sins of the people, and considering that there was only a two-hour window that it could be done by Jewish law, there was a two-hour window prior to twilight that they had to slaughter these animals. Considering the number of animals and the two-hour time limit they had, he estimates this, that it took 600 priests sacrificing four lambs a minute to satisfy the requirement for the forgiveness of sins. Wow. And so what we know, just, just numerically, what we know is that flowing out of the temple was this stream and this river of the blood of all of the animals who had been sacrificed for the sins of the people. As a matter of fact, and we mentioned it Sunday, that the Brook Kidron, that, that temple was a, had a sharp drop-off down into the Brook Kidron, and that brook flowed red with blood. The history records for several days after Passover, it would flow red with blood of all of the animals that had been sacrificed for all of the sins of the people. The writer of Hebrews reminds us of something, though, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. It is impossible 
for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. They were doing it, and they were thinking and praying that it would work, and, and it would temporarily work for a year, but then they would have to come back every year. For it is impossible for the blood of earthly lambs to ultimately remove our sins. They were pointing to a more perfect sacrifice. And this is why you can't overlook the imagery that we find throughout the Scriptures. When John the Baptist saw Jesus in John chapter 1, when he saw him, this is what prompted him to make this statement. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, to understand the Passover, we need to go back to the book of Exodus. Perhaps you're familiar with how the Passover began. Perhaps you don't know anything about that. Perhaps you've not read that in the Scriptures and you're, you're not familiar with that. We go all the way back to uh, Exodus chapter 11. God's people had been in bondage, slavery, by the Pharaoh. And Moses had told the Pharaoh that God says to let my people go. And the Pharaoh says, no, I will not. And so God begins to send these plagues upon these people of Egypt. He sends nine plagues. And in Exodus chapter 11, verse 1, he says this, The Lord said to Moses, Yet one plague more I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. And so that, that plague would be the plague of death. It would be a plague by which every firstborn male would die. A plague by which God instructed his people to, to sacrifice a lamb and to spread the blood of that lamb over the doorpost of the home of your family. And when the... The angel of death passes over, and if he sees the blood of the lamb over the doorpost of your homes, your family and your home will be spared. But if he does not see that blood, he will destroy that home, and he will kill every firstborn male in that family. And that is exactly what happened. Now before that night occurred... God had also given His people instructions that they were to prepare a meal as they were getting ready to go. And they were to prepare a meal and they were to cleanse themselves and they were to sacrifice this spotless lamb and they were to, to eat unleavened bread for they, were to not, they did not have time. They were to, they were to eat with their back, packs on their back being ready to go. He gave specific instructions as to the things that they were to do before that night came. And just as he promised, that night came. And in Exodus chapter 12 and verse um, 13 um, it says, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And then watch this. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast of the Lord throughout your generations. As a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. So here it is, as it's instituted, this Passover feast became a marker. It became a memorial for those who whom God had delivered, that they were to celebrate from this moment on forever and ever. And just as God had promised, the firstborn were dead on the next morning of those who did not have the blood, and Pharaoh said to go. Verse 17, it says, You shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. But I want you to notice something in verse 17. Um, go to the next slide if you would. He, he says this in verse 2. Excuse me. Verse 17, I just read verse 2. Watch this. This month that I have done this, this month of this Passover that I have delivered you, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. So after this, God changed the entire calendar of the nation of Israel. Their calendar had begun when they had planted the crops, just as any agricultural community could understand. This is where our calendar begins. But at this moment, God says, hey, I'm changing the entire calendar. Why? Because the Passover represented something great that God had done, something that, where God had delivered His people. And it's important to remember this because they knew and as they continued to carry out this, 
this observance of this feast, as they even got to the time of Jesus, every Jew knew this. This was the beginning of our calendar. Why? Because God had done something great for us. God had delivered it, delivered us, and they had at this time, by the time Jesus comes on the scene, they had associated the Passover not only with God doing something great then, but that God was going to do something great in the future, and he was going to send the Messiah. This is what they believed, and this is what they celebrated. And so, folks, it is no accident that Jesus celebrates this as his last meal with the disciples. For God was about to do something even greater for his people. They even had a quote that they would say at Passover. It says, on, the night, on that night, the Passover, we were redeemed. And on, that, and on that night, they believed that they would be redeemed in the future. And this is exactly what Jesus was about to do. I mentioned that three million people had entered into Jerusalem to celebrate the feast. It didn't matter what you were doing. It didn't matter where you lived. It didn't matter your calendar. You cleared your calendar that you would be in Jerusalem during the Feast of the Passover. And you celebrated this. And so with all of the Jews coming in, there was a difficult time finding places, as I said. They had fixed up the city. They had prepared the roads. They had prepared the bridges. They, they had done everything that they could to make the city ready. And this is why Jesus told them in Luke 22, Hey guys, verse six, 8, go and prepare the Passover for us. They had to make preparations, and this is exactly what they did. Now, let me talk about this meal. Jesus had laid out some very specific, God had laid out some very specific things that they were to do, as I said, back in Egypt during this meal. Jewish tradition had also added some other things that they were to eat and that they were to say and that they were to do. We're familiar, as we're going to celebrate here in just a moment, with this, this cup and this bread. But one of the things that you may not know, if you'll read this, you can get a little bit confused as to all of the mentionings of, of how many times they drank and how many times they ate. I want you to notice something. Look at what it says in verse 17. He took a cup. This is at the beginning. And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. Well, then you come to verse 19. He took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Well, then down in verse 20, the next verse, it says, likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, eaten saying, this cup is poured out for you. So what you have are these different times where it says they're drinking of a cup, they're eating bread, they're doing these sorts of things. How do you know what was first? How do you know what was involved? It was a very intricate ceremony that they did. It's a beautiful reminder if you've never had a, a participation, a participated in the Seder that they, they, the Jews call their, that meal the Seder meal. And it's a beautiful symbolic imagery of what God had done and for you and I to look back on what God has done in the future for us. But I want you to know that I did not know this. There were four cups involved in the Passover meal. There were four different times that they would drink during the Passover meal, and they were very symbolic. Luke records two of those cups in his story. There was a cup to begin the entire meal that the leader would take and drink and, and begin the ceremony. And then there was the eating of a, of a portion of the meal, and then there was a second cup. These go back to, where do we get these from? Why four cups? It goes all the way back to Exodus. I want to show you something, and this is very symbolic. It very, has very great meaning for you and me as believers. Back in Exodus chapter 6, even before the Passover had been instituted, this is what God had said to his people. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord... I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And as I highlighted here these four verbs, these became verbs that were represented by the four cups. 
Each cup represented an action that God had done on behalf of his people. One, I will bring you out. Two, I will deliver you. Three, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. And I will take you to be my people. And so they recognized these activities of God and their and their the life of the nation of Israel, and they were celebrating that with each cup that they would use. After the second cup, this unleavened bread was broken, and then the Passover meal would begin, and they would eat these bitter herbs to remind them of the, the bitterness of slavery. And, and then there would be this third cup. And and so Jesus is walking through this, knowing the symbolism. But I want you to know what he did. Notice what he did. Jesus breaks with tradition in a big way. He breaks with tradition in a big way. Go ahead, if you would, to verse 19. He took bread, this unleavened bread, and he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, if we could get a picture of the disciples as they were around that table, they knew what was coming. They had memorized it. They knew what they were going to say. They knew all the stuff that went with it. If we could get a picture, what we would see after Jesus says this is all of those disciples with their mouths hanging open. For Jesus says, do this in remembrance of the Passover. Do this in remembrance of me. Hmm. You know what he's saying? Hey, guys, and all who will follow me, I want you to have a new focus. It's not on the Passover. It's not on what happened 1,500 years ago but and how God had redeemed and how God had saved his people, but it is on me and what I am about to do. To save my people. I am about to go. I am about to give myself. And so as long as you do this, don't do it in remembrance of the Passover. You do this in remembrance of me. For I am about to change history. This is why Paul says, Christ, our Passover lamb, had been sacrificed. And then after that, he went to this cup in verse 20. He took the cup. Now, the third cup was the cup of redemption. You remember the four verbs that God had done for his people? The third verb, the third cup, was the cup of redemption. God was going to redeem his people. How would he redeem his people? Oh, he had delivered them and saved them in the past. But now he was about to redeem them with the precious blood of his son. He was going to redeem them. He would save them through the blood of his son. Taking them back and reminding them of what he had done in Exodus. How he delivered them and they, he passed over them and saved them by the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the spotless Lamb of God was about to be sacrificed. He was about to make atonement for our sins. It's an interesting note when you go back and you study this Passover and the plagues of Egypt. We find an interesting description that the people of Egypt had put up with what God had sent. It had been disastrous. Whether you talk about the gnats, you talk about the boils, you talk about the frogs, you talk about the sky, uh, the sun turning to blood, you, you talk about those miserable times, but they were tolerating it. But when you come to this issue of death, they couldn't tolerate. And can I tell you something? If you're here listening tonight and you do not know the Lord Christ, you can tolerate a lot of things. You will not be able to tolerate your death. For it is appointed to every man once to die and after that the judgment. 
And we will all die and we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. And God's standard is perfection. And the scriptures tell us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin in Hebrews chapter 9. You cannot find forgiveness. You cannot escape this plague of death. Unless there is the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of your sins. And so it would be that Jesus not only would go and offer his body. What does that mean? As a substitute, as a replacement for me. The death that I deserved, he died for me. And he not only put his body there, but he paid for my sins. He paid for them all by the shedding of his blood. And so we cannot overlook this beautiful Passover celebration that Jesus planned as his last meal. That he would share with his disciples. For he is our Passover lamb. He is the one who gave his body and shed his blood for you and for me. I think there's an interesting quote at the end of the Hebrew Passover meal that they had developed by the time that Jesus came on the scene. This is a quote that they said at the end of every meal. And I think it's important and it's, it's perfect for you and for me. Listen to this. Therefore... We are bound to give thanks, praise, and glorify Him who wrought all these wonders for our fathers and for us. He brought us out from bondage to freedom, from sorrow to gladness, from darkness to light, from bondage to redemption. From redemption. So let us say before Him, Hallelujah. Isn't that incredibly accurate for what you and I experience, for those of us who know Him? He has brought us from bondage. From bondage to freedom, from sorrow to gladness, from darkness to light, from bondage to redemption. And for that, we praise him for what he has done. And so Jesus says, as often as you take of this bread and you drink of this cup, do it in remembrance of him. I believe it was Martin Luther. I've been reading a quote here recently. Why do we need to hear the gospel every day? And the simple reason is this. We forget the gospel every day. We forget the gospel every day, and so we need to hear the gospel every day. And so when we take of this bread and we drink of this cup, you know what we're doing? We're proclaiming what the Lord has done for us and for the entire world who is lost without Him. So I just want to now transition as we do this Lord's Supper together. Perhaps you're preparing for that and you've got these elements next to you. Who can take of this Lord's Supper? Anyone that knows the Lord Christ? Anyone who has been forgiven? You don't have to be Baptist. You don't have to be American. You have to know the Lord Christ. This is for anyone who has done that. For anyone who knows Christ should celebrate it and praise Him for what he has done. And we should remember. And so just a reminder of what occurred on that night. As we have read in Luke. But Paul gives an account as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you for the substitute of your life. You took our place. Where we deserve to die, you took our place. And so, Lord, we're grateful. And so we remember the substitution of yourself in our place. You giving of yourself for us. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And then in verse 25, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it. In remembrance of me. Lord, you are the perfect sacrifice. 
And you have shed your blood for our sins. Father, thank you. Thank you that it was forever. Thank you that it is finished. Thank you that once and for all we can know the forgiveness of our sins. And so, Father, may we never, ever forget. May we always be reminded of the gospel, for we forget the gospel daily. And so, may you remind us. Thank you for the privilege that we have to be able to do that tangibly through the Lord's Supper. And thank you for the way that we're able to do that tonight, to be reminded of the body and the blood of Jesus and for what he's done for us. And so, Lord, we praise you. We thank you. We look forward to Sunday. Lord, may we gather as your people, celebrating the fact that you are you're no longer dead. You are alive, and you are alive forevermore. And you rule, and you reign, and you are returning again. As we sang earlier, you're coming to take us home. And for that, we are grateful. Father, until then, may we, may we proclaim this gospel. May we, may we proclaim your body and your blood and what you have done for us until you return. Make us faithful to do that. Lord, you have scattered us. You have pulled us away from our traditions. You've pulled us away from our comforts and our conveniences. Lord, you have scattered us and you have done that for one reason. And that is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. So I know this weekend, folks, folks will be more than ever. Folks will be uh, attuned to what you're wanting to say to a world that is troubled and a world that is confused. God, we know the answer. And we have peace that passes understanding for you have redeemed us. And for that, we are grateful. Thank you that you are our Passover lamb. In Jesus' name that we pray, amen.